Hi everyone, my name is Jen, I'm an author and a book reviewer and today I am here today, today I am here today, great start, today I am here to talk to you about all the books that I've read in April, there were quite a few of them, I am coming to you from relative chaos, I mean we have a bookcase now, for anyone who isn't already familiar with my channel, we just moved house, so um, yeah it's a little bit all over the place right now, in fact this is what my office looked like about 10 minutes ago. I do not enjoy this chaos. What do you think of this Lola? It's a mess isn't it? It will get sorted but we're not there quite yet. So I'm here to talk to you about all of these books and I read a few of them in reading vlogs throughout the month. Let me just move stuff out of the way. I'm still trying to work out where to film to be honest. I don't know if it's too dark in here because the window is quite far back. Maybe I need to find a different place but this is where we're going to film today. We can figure it out together. Some of these books I did read in reading vlogs throughout the month so where relevant I'll link those in the description box down below as well but we've got quite a lot to get through so let's just get on with it. Okay so in April it was Disability Readathon and I had big ambitions for all the books that I was going to read. I didn't talk about it in a video because I had a feeling that it might not happen given everything else that was going on in April and I'm glad that I didn't because that proved correct. So I'm going to be carrying over some of my um, tentative TBR from April into May and reading more of those books this month which is completely fine and I will list in the description box down below a video that I did a couple of months ago talking about over a hundred different books that focus on disability and disfigurement that I would recommend slash are on my TBR. So the one book that I did read for Disability Readathon in April was this which is Frida Kahlo and My Left Leg by Emily Rapp Black. I have now ordered her memoir which is called um, poster child. She was a poster child for a charity growing up as an amputee in the States as a kid. Um, but this book is about her adult life and her relationship with Frida Kahlo's art um, because Frida is also an amputee and talking about how she wants to push back against this misconception of disabled creatives that pain is a muse because it's just not accurate and I can attest to that myself as a disabled author. In fact she says, let me find the quote, art has been codified as therapy. It is so ridiculous I want to cry or scream something. Instead I keep walking. Art from pain is not therapeutic. It is necessary and the muse is always survival through the pain, not over it, not because of it and not even despite it. She covers so many topics that I find really interesting like folklore and disability and art and disability and she juxtaposes the way that people look at disabled bodies in the freak show and then the way that people look at art in an art gallery and how many non-disabled people will only critically look at and examine disability if they are confronted with it in an artistic way, if it allows them to remove or gives them permission to acknowledge a feeling of discomfort, it's only then that they will sit with that feeling and then not always accurately either. As I said, this deals with people thinking that, that Frida Kahlo and other disabled artists are pushing through the pain or inspired by it, that it, that it, it moves them to a greater purpose instead of seeing disability in a realistic way and also appreciating the art that a disabled creator is making. This book also talks about the death of her son which is really really difficult to read. Um, the writing in it is superb, let me just read you a little bit. The bitter smell of espresso floats from the coffee cart set up near the vine-coloured wall at the museum's entrance. I feel happy in a way that makes me feel guilty and strange to myself. I am walking around in a tactile, almost chewable darkness, shining lights into the unseen and shameful corners of my own heart. I hate this. I love that. I'm full of disbelief, aching with it, and the only fairy tales that make sense to me are those that include a true darkness a legitimate flaw, the soft bruise you find with your thumb while holding an otherwise perfect looking apple in your palm. This is definitely one of my favourite books of the year so far and I would say if you've read Rebecca Towsig's work then I think you would really really love this too. 
Okay, so last week, the Women's Prize for Fiction shortlist was announced. In March, I filmed a really long video, I think it was about an hour and a half, a reading vlog, reading as many of the long-listed books as I could. There were 16 long-listed, and I managed to read eight and a half of them. And then um, about a week before the shortlist was announced, I was sent the shortlist because I work in publishing. So I had a head start on reading the shortlisted books. And the day that the shortlist was announced, I uploaded another reading vlog, reading the three books from the six shortlisted books that I hadn't yet read. So the three books that I had already read were The Bread the Devil Need by Lisa Allen Agostini, The Sentence by Louise Erdrich, and The Book of Form and Emptiness by Ruth Zecki, which I won't talk about here because I talked about it in the longest reading vlog and I read them in March. So I also talked about them in last month's wrap up. But the three that I hadn't yet read, I did read this month. So firstly, I read The Island of Missing Trees by Alicia Shafak, and unfortunately, I really didn't enjoy this one. It was the tone primarily. Um, the plot is that it's about a young girl called Ada, which means island. Her parents are from Turkish and Greek families in Cyprus during a civil war, and they got together and they moved to the UK, had Ada, and it's just very earnest and very sentimental. I appreciated the political topics that it was talking about, but it used a lot of devices to mythologize the story, which definitely fits because it includes a lot of, for instance, Greek myth, and it's partly narrated by a fig tree. But in removing the characters, so they kind of sat behind the themes, they ended up not being fully formed to me and they were, you know, moving parts so that the author could get across the points that she wanted to make. And as I said in the shortlist vlog, which I'll link down below, I don't often mind that. For instance, Ali Smith does that a lot where she's definitely trying to talk about something very political and she's using characters in order to make that happen. But I feel as though she's extra transparent about it and also I much prefer her writing style and the writing style in this was just not something that I could really get behind and so consequently the whole thing just kind of fell apart for me. I know so many people love this book and I respect it for that but it's just not my cup of tea. Then I read Sorrow and Bliss by Meg Mason and this one I enjoyed the reading process of but it's definitely a forgettable book. I just haven't thought about it at all since I finished reading it and something that was interesting about both of these books was that they share a lot of similarities with other books that were either on the shortlist or the long list. So The Island of Missing Trees is very similar to The Book of Form and Emptiness because they're both partly narrated by what well, objects slash plants. They're about philosophy, they're about immigration and family and losing a parent. Um, and Sorrow and Bliss in turn is very much like The Paper Palace meets The Exhibitionist. So as I mentioned in my shortest video, I wonder how I would have felt about this book if I'd read it before either of those other two books. By this point, I just felt like I'd heard this story so many times before, not just in those books, but elsewhere in literature. I didn't feel like it was particularly innovative. It's about a woman who's looking back on two past marriages. I did appreciate the way that it talked about mental health, and I did also like the balance it had between being really um, emotional and also very funny. I thought that that was very good, but it just didn't do anything really new for me. And for that, I can't, I just can't love it. And then the last book from the shortlist before we get onto the other books I read was The Great Circle by Maggie Shipstead. And I adored this book. It's not a faultless book, what book is faultless, but there is so much to admire and love in this. It is epic storytelling. It is split across two narratives. So we've got Marion Graves, who's a pilot in the early decades of the 20th century. And then in the later decades of the 20th century, we have got, what is her name? Hadley Baxter. Hadley Baxter, who is playing Marion in a film and is researching her life, thinking about her life. And it talks about the freedoms that women have or didn't have in those two time periods. It looks at the mirroring aspects of their lives because they have very similar things going on. They're both brought up by their uncle, for instance, and their parents have died in very dramatic ways to do with transportation and now Marion wants to go out and fly around the world and Hadley wants to metaphorically follow in her footsteps. I had lots more to say about it in the shortlist video so if you want to hear my in-depth thoughts you can head over there. Next for my Patreon book club we read Kindred by Octavia E. Butler and I was so glad that this gave me the push to pick this up 
sooner than I probably would have done otherwise. I have been meaning to get to this book for years, but because it's such a cult classic, it's one of those books that I almost feel like I have read because I've heard so many people talk about it, but obviously I hadn't read it. And now having read it, I am just so, so grateful that it exists. For some reason, I thought it was gonna be more character driven, slow paced in the vein of social science fiction like The Handmaid's Tale, but it is not. It is firmly in the fast paced, drop you in it science fiction world where you have to scrabble around to pick up the pieces and assemble them and try and work out what's going on. And that's very apt because Dana, the protagonist in this book, is in a hugely difficult situation where she is also trying to piece together what is happening. So we follow Dana, it's set in the 1970s, which is when it was written and published. Dana is a black woman in the States and one day, she time travels. I mean, like at the beginning, I was like, this is so ridiculous. There is no explanation for this time travel. I don't know who Dana is yet. I know nothing about her. You're just dropped into the action, and that's not the kind of book that I'm drawn to. But as a black woman in the 1970s, time traveling back to early 1800s America during slavery times and immediately being put in these horrendous, awful situations. You don't need to know a thing about her. You don't need to know what's going on because you're already so invested and on her side and you want her to escape. Um, so she is transported to this time. She has no idea what is going on. She does not know why it has happened. And she sees a young white boy who she learns is called Rufus, who's drowning in a river. She feels compelled to save him. And she's trying to save him while his mum is beating her up because she thinks that she's trying to harm her child. And over the course of the first few chapters, she realizes that Rufus is an ancestor of hers. And he is the son of a plantation owner. And Rufus summons unconsciously Dana to help him whenever he feels as though his life is in danger. So Dana goes back and forth in time. And at first I thought, is this sustainable, this repetition? But Octavia E. Butler immediately mixes it up with the time travel by, I'm just gonna say this and I'll leave it, by dragging Dana's husband, who is white, back in time with her. And that just creates a whole different story. I think I would have loved a more world building in the 1970s bit and more character development, but this book is brilliant. It is harrowing and horrible and a masterclass in tension. I really, really recommend it, which you didn't need me to say because everyone loves it, but let me just unnecessarily add my own, it's brilliant to the long list of people who have already said that. Next, I read Wet Paint by Chloe Ashby. This is a debut novel and it is about a 20-something woman called Eve whose best friend Grace has recently died and she has just lost her sense of self and she is trying to find it through art, looking at it and also taking up life drawing herself. The title Wet Paint kind of reflects her form. She is not fully fixed yet. She's feeling very fluid. She's feeling as though she really needs some kind of grounding. So this is a book all about that. And I reviewed this for Toast. So if you would like some more thoughts on this book, I will link that article in the description box down below. Finally, in April, I read lots of books that had been long listed for the Jalak Prize. The Jalak Prize is awarded to a British writer of color every year or a writer of colour who currently lives in Britain. And when the long list had been announced, I'd already read two of them, which was Nikesh Shikla's memoir and also Cynthia Miller's poetry collection, Honorifics. I owned um, four of the others and then went ahead and purchased three more and read them. So those were Things We Do Not Tell The People We Love by Huma Qureshi. I also reviewed this within the Tota article as well, so that's linked down below. This is one of the best short story collections that I have ever read. I really didn't like the first story for some reason, but the rest I did. It's all about the silence that we create when we're trying to protect ourselves, cushion ourselves, but really we're just screaming inside. It's about miscommunication between family members. The second story is brilliant and it's about a daughter who convinces herself that every time she sees her mum it's going to be different. They're not going to argue, it's going to be great. She has this idealised version of what their communication is going to be like and every time it fails and it has a really 
explosive ending. I loved it. I enjoyed A Blood Condition by Kaio Chigoni, but I definitely preferred his debut, which was called Kumakanda. I adored Like a Tree Walking by Varney Kappel Deo. And um, I spoke about all of the Jalak books in the Jalak vlog, but I think especially for my reviews of these, I would suggest heading over there because I talked about specific poems, pulled out specific lines, talked about imagery and why those ones particularly worked for me. I enjoyed Somebody Loves You by Mona Arshi. This is a very fragmented novel that reminded me of Reasons She Goes to the Wood by Deborah K. Davies. If you are in the mood for reading a coming of age novel, which is very poetically written because Mona is a poet herself, then I would recommend this. I probably prefer her poetry in the same way that I prefer Ocean Vong's poetry to his novel, but so many other people love his novel more than his poetry. So I may be in the minority with this as well. Maybe you will absolutely adore her novel. Um, I don't know, but if the themes sound up your street, then go and check out her work. I read Consumed by Arifa Akbar, which also looks at art and self and trauma. Um, I feel like I read a lot of books that touched on those subjects this month, which is very welcome for me because they're subjects that very much interest me. So Arifa has write, written this book, which is talking about finding her sister through art. Her sister was an artist and she died of TB and she traces the history of TB and also looks at artists who were sick themselves. And she has created this kaleidoscopic, painful, wonderful memoir. And I just was completely swept up by it. I also really enjoyed this graphic memoir, which is called The Roles We Play by Sabah Khan. It's about British Pakistani diaspora, but mainly it's about family dynamics. And she talks about triangles within families, daughters and the mother and how those should be. Can you hear a sad dog at the door? <laughs> Two seconds. Element. Hi. Um, she talks about yeah the triangles in family relationships and how triangles are supposedly the strongest structure but she hasn't found that to be the case in a metaphorical sense and I really enjoyed her exploration of that and if you would like to see examples of the artwork um, and more in-depth thoughts on the graphic memoir you can head over to the Jalak vlog and then finally the last book is one that I'm carrying over into May this is The Khan by Simon Mir, which is about um, organised crime and specifically one family where the head of that family dies and the daughter who has left the family circle and has gone off and had her own life is summoned back to take his place. So I've only just started this, so I don't really have anything to say about it yet, but I will continue reading it in May and I will talk to you about it at the end of this month. So those are all the books that I read in April. I will list them in the description box down below. I would love to know if you have read any of these or if you're keen to pick any of them up. If you enjoyed this video and you're not already subscribed and you would like to, it would be lovely to have you around. And if you like my content and have the means to support me on Patreon, that would also be very kind. Link to that is in the description box down below as well. I think I need to go take this one for a W A L K, which I won't say in case she starts barking. Um, and I hope that you're all doing all right. And I will speak to you very soon. Sending love. Bye.